I can be surrounded by people and it's like oh, I'm eating by myself here. So, um, so it's kinder for me to not try to have a partner, not try to host all these people because it's that just, if I'm eating alone, let's make it look like that. I have my little table, I'm the only one in the room, I'm eating alone. But when I'm eating alone at a table full of people, it confuses me. I feel like there's something wrong with me or I project it on them. They're excluding me. I, you know, it's just like, just let me have my table and just accept this is the walk we're doing this life. I eat alone. Hello, and welcome to Square Peg, the podcast in which neurodivergent women, trans and non-binary people explore navigating a neurotypical world and share their insights, challenges, and successes. I hope that these conversations will be inspiring and thought-provoking, open you up to new ways of thinking about being neurodivergent, and help you feel more connected to a worldwide community of people with similar experiences. I'm Amy Richards, and after being diagnosed autistic at the age of 37, I'm now on a mission to learn more about different perspectives and issues around being a neurodivergent adult in a world that feels like it doesn't quite fit. My guest today is an American playwright, performer, director and activist. She was diagnosed autistic last year at the age of 68. She is the author of 12 books and close to 90 lesbian and feminist themed plays and her work is widely published and performed. She toured for 22 years in her internationally acclaimed one woman show, The Second Coming of Joan of Arc. She has won numerous awards, including the Lambda Literary Award in Drama for Best LGBT Books in the US. She was born in Virginia and currently lives on Mount Desert Island off the coast of Maine, where she still writes and occasionally performs. Today, I'm delighted to share my conversation with Carolyn Gage. In our conversation, we talk about growing up undiagnosed autistic in the 1950s in a dysfunctional home, escaping from reality as a child and confronting it as an adult. Energy, Shut down and burnout, the intersection of autism, feminism, gender, and sexuality, masking and relationships, and choosing to live alone. I hope you'll enjoy our conversation as much as I did. Please be aware that there is mention of childhood trauma and abuse from the start of this episode, so if you don't want to hear about this topic, you might want to give this one a miss. So, hi Carolyn, and welcome to Square Peg. It's really lovely to meet you. How are you feeling about being on the podcast today? I'm just thrilled. It's um, I'm so happy you're doing this, and I really enjoyed some of your other podcasts. Thank you. It's really lovely to hear. So I'd like to start with a lot with a question, really, but just by saying how, what an impressive body of work that you've done over the course of your life so far and put out into the world. It's absolutely incredible how prolific you are. You know what? That is the gift of autism. And that's kind of something I was going to touch on later on, really. Yeah. Is that how that kind of interplays, really? Yeah. But yeah, we'll definitely come back and talk about that a little bit later on. But first of all, I'd like to talk to you about your diagnosis. So I was really interested to hear that you were diagnosed just last year um, when you were at the age of 68. So that puts you in, I think, one of the older people that I've interviewed in terms of the age of you were at diagnosis. So how did it all come about? Well, I um, had a friend in Australia uh, who got involved in some kind of, or maybe she was in England at the time. She got involved in some kind of public meltdown that involved locking herself on a subway bathroom and police were called and it just went from there. And, you know, she wrote this up and she wrote up her subsequent attempts to raise awareness and... um and in doing, in having this whole horrific episode, she realized she was autistic and that it was a meltdown. And um, and so that kind of intrigued me because she she's not as old as I am, but I think she's in her forties. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, and I began to kind of follow what she was posting more. And there was something she posted about children tiptoeing, and it was okay. like that. That was the moment. It was like. Oh my God, I spent my childhood on my tiptoes 
Everybody commented on it. Everybody tried to get me not to. I felt sorry for anybody who didn't. It put me in a little bit of a space, not quite, you know, in my own personal space. And it felt great. And um, no, years, years uh, on tiptoe everywhere all the time. And so I started Googling it. It was like, yeah, this is a thing. And, and horrifyingly, there's all these websites on how to get your kid not to. I'm like, oh my God, you should teach yourself to do it. It's awesome. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know. So that was my introduction to some of the autism struggle. Like, no, don't. Don't don't make your children flat footed if they don't want to, you know, so that was it. And then, of course, it was followed immediately by the work noise. That's what it was called in my family. And it was a real low buzzing humming noise that I would make. It was like a it was like a drone droning. It was not melodic. And I would do this for hours and hours and hours at a time. And it was usually when I was happy and absorbed in something. And so if you heard the work noise coming out of my room, it was a good thing. Um, still do it. Not publicly, but still do the work noise. And then I flap when I get excited and people have made autism jokes forever. Like, oh my God, Carolyn, you look autistic. And now I'm like, yeah, what's your point? Um, yeah, funny that. <laughs> I know. And I think the thing... Um, this is the third great shock of my life. The first was at 32 uh, or 33. I retrieved memories of, of, of uh, uh, an abusive childhood. That mm -hmm. God knows where I put those, but I realized everything I thought about my relationship to my family was a lie. And that was just kind of out of the blue, like, oh, my God. And then, you know, short on the heels of that was like, oh, my God, I'm so lesbian. How did I miss that? You know what? What's with this getting married thing? What what was I thinking? And here it is at 68. I hope I'm done. I hope I'm done with those moments of like, oh my God, I'm not who I thought I was. But it's very similar uh, to those other two revelations where suddenly a lot of things make sense. I can recruit allies and organize myself better um, with this knowledge. And then, so then I found Wilma Wake who did a podcast with you. And she is a therapist who is autistic herself and also diagnosed late in life. And she just published a book co-authored about late in life uh, diagnosis. Yes. Um, and she she kind of, you know, diagnosed me, which I mean, I I'm buzzing, humming, flapping, tiptoeing. I mean, you know, I was and then and then there's so much more like if you want to get into the dollhouse slash playwriting later. But uh, I just feel like. At 68, it, I really was not even pursuing an official diagnosis. It's like so obvious now that I'm completely, mm. totally on the spectrum. Oh, that's so interesting that just that one physical trait was the catalyst then really for this whole yeah. thing. Yeah. Who knew? Well, and you know, I mean, I'm not ignorant about autism. <clears throat> I used to teach adaptive PE and before that I volunteered in um, special ed classrooms. I worked with autistic boys, you know, and very, you know, blatant flapping and, you know, and I, it, I'm kind of stunned now, like work noise. What the hell? So is this something you do it just without realizing you're doing it? Mm, I usually am pretty aware that I'm, as an adult, I don't yes. talk with people around. Sure. And I get a, I get a new roommate and it's like, oh, how long before they say something about the work noise? <laughs> 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 mm, yeah. So, um, yeah. And then I also um, make a racket with the corners of pages when I read a book. To this day, I can't read in the presence of anybody else, much less a library or something. I would be kicked out. I just don't enjoy reading and can't absorb the material if I don't have this uh, tactile and audible thing going on. I know, and everybody's mm -hmm. like, you didn't know until you were 68, you're autistic. But hi, hi, hi. Um, I'm going to say performer instead of achiever. Hi, hi, performer. That's why I think nobody picked up on it. And that's so common, isn't it? For those of us who appear to be going through life and achieving things and getting somewhere. But well, also my brother was, uh, I realize now, autistic and his issues, he had very pronounced echolalia. Uh, you know, he would, okay. um, 
My father was extremely uh, abusive, sexual, physical, emotional, but a verbal abuser, a bully. And my brother would be in a social situation, like we're going to some kind of party or family gathering, and he would just walk in and begin to imitate the perpetrator. He would do a whole full uh, imitation of him, including the voice, and then start repeating over and over again the abusive things my father would say. Absolutely no context. And, and people would just, it was just very clear that my brother was different. Mm. And he couldn't, he was very uh, challenged academically and had to be, we were in private schools and he was moved to a public school. You know, so my brother was the designated hire a tutor, figure this out. It's the 1950s, mm. um, you know, and all right, I buzz and I flap, but you know what? I make straight A's. So, you know, I, that was like, she's fine. David, on the other hand, oh my God, you know? So um, I think that was part of it, that if I had had siblings that were neurotypical, uh, the tiptoe buzz flap thing might've attracted more attention. But in my household, where we've got two addicts and a, a male who's struggling in school and blatantly has antisocial behaviors or, or behaviors that are, they're very disruptive socially mm -hmm. uh, because they made no sense. And, you know, so, yeah, I think that I just was like mascot child of the alcoholic family. Like, yeah, she's good. She's going to, she's going to make A's. She's going to be fine. It's almost it would be more more apparent had your family situation been different. Yes. When the problems are, mo are not really problems in terms of other people. Yeah, and sexism was very big. I was in a, a, an upper middle class Virginia 1950s family. And my father, you know, was the third generation in a law firm his great grandfather had founded. And my brother would, of course, be David Mead White the third, you know, it was like they all had the same name. He was born with huge expectations. Mm -hmm. He was the man and nothing I did counted. It was nice. It's nice that I'm, you know, making A's, but it didn't mean anything. Every, and, you know, my brother got all the attention. He got everything, you know, and I envied that. But I also, as I look at it now, what a burden for somebody who is struggling. So how do you feel now then about your diagnosis or realization about your autism? Because you've had a little bit of time to, I guess, process it a bit since you... you. It's like, oh, thank God. Now a whole range of things make perfect sense. I'm not trying to, as your lovely name of your website, I'm not trying to pound the square peg into the round hole anymore. Um, mm -hmm. And I think with the autism... I tell people, I work in theater and I tell them up front I'm autistic. Sometimes you have to stand in front of me and flag me down and I'll get going on some particular rant that may no longer be relevant. Just, you know, just talk to me. And I feel everybody in the room relax. You know, I just feel everybody has permission. I, I just, and I do that with service people, um, you know, when they come into my home, I, you know, I think I would be, I think that there's something about me that would disturb them. And I would just say, you know, I'm autistic. And uh, sometimes I get real absorbed in, you know, whatever it is, pest control or whatever it is we're trying to do. And sometimes they share with me. I have a handyman who's uh, neurodivergent. And uh, I just felt everything shifted then. He had a way of dealing with people that uh, hired him as if they were, you know, oh, some exalted something. And we just hang like, you know, like uh, peers. Mm -hmm. And I felt like that was a, a really lovely shift for him. And he told me that he felt very relaxed around me. Yeah, and I encouraged him to let people know, you know, if you if got something going on, let people know and they'll be much kinder. I felt like he, had been bullied a lot and did not believe that. I wasn't bullied. I don't understand why I wasn't, except that I went to a private girls' school. The bullying in my life happened in my adult years and still is ongoing. But I skipped that whole horrendous, I don't know why. Smart, maybe? I don't know. Masking well? I don't, I have no idea. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess it's not something that is experienced by every single person, is it? Um... 
I think also when you're in a private when you're in a private school, if a child is being bullied, uh, their parents are paying some money and they're going to call up the school because there was active discouragement of cliques, excluding people. Um, you know, so there was a very active culture of staying sweet in that school that it probably wouldn't have happened in public school. And I, and I wonder whether, presumably with smaller classes as well and fewer pupils, it's easier for teachers to manage and, and keep an eye on that sort of thing, isn't it? I imagine. It is. And also with the absence of males in the classroom, I think there wasn't such an emphasis on looks. Uh, the premium was on brains. And I was someone who performed very well in classrooms. So there may have been bullying going on, but it wasn't directed at me and I didn't see it. So I think looking back then to your childhood, and obviously it sounds like it was a very difficult childhood in lots of ways, but what was, what, what were the sort of happy moments of your childhood? What did you oh enjoy doing? <laughs> <laughs> I was blessed with, um, imaginative powers and I uh, had a doll house with about 50 dolls I mean you know and you know my friends played dolls they pull out the dolls and put dresses on them and take them off no when I I went into the doll house and I'd go into an altered state for six to eight hours at a time because my world was unbearable and evil always prevailed in my world which was confusing because my perpetrator was a judge. So that remained a, a source of enormous difficulty for me. But in the world of the dollhouse, things worked out the way they should. And I would craft these like BBC miniseries that went on for weeks in every character. They were very complex, the relationships to each other. I mean, it was a castle, and, you know, and it was also matriarchal. There was a queen and there, my favorite doll I'd rescued from the neighbors. She had had her hair all torn out and been marked up all over with a, a pen. And uh, so she was a survivor. We didn't talk about what had happened to her, but she was a survivor. She was gender nonconforming, perhaps gender ambiguous. And she was a warrior. And I mean, I look back later, it's like she's totally a survivor and, uh, and a lesbian and a butch. I'm like, you know, I didn't have words for any of that, but I knew instinctively this is the alter ego. This is this is the heroine of my story, and and she had this goddess queen figure that was matriarchal, and 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 I mean, but the play that I and my mother identified that I would never leave the room left to myself. So she made me pack it up every summer, and and so I got a small set of dolls, and I'd go into the woods and do the entire book of Peter Pan, you know, in the woods. And, you know, uh, the name of the game was spend as little time as possible in reality, which saved my life as a child, but caused me enormous difficulty, as you can imagine, as an adult. I was a romance junkie and couldn't figure out why that didn't last. I, uh, I have 30 years practically 30 years in Al-Anon, which is a recovery program for people raised by addicts. And embracing reality is my recovery. And that was a new concept. That was the, that, no, why would you, reality is disgusting. Um, but obviously my life wasn't working. And as Tennessee Williams says, you know, reality always wins because it's real. Now, I was 40 when I read that, and it was like a lightning bolt. I, so obvious, right? But, you know, I was autistic. It was like, oh, now you tell me. Because, you know, when you have the kind of dissociative abilities that I have, I really felt I could beat reality. I certainly could give it a good run. But it's true. It's like reality is going to win because at the end of the day, what I'm doing isn't real. And yeah, that so you can't hide I, from it forever. It, well, and that's when I got serious about my recovery. Embrace it. My spiritual path is learning to embrace reality, which is my dollhouse play morphed into playwriting, professional playwriting. And I think my recovery program informs that because reality, when you embrace it, is fascinating. It's full of contradiction. It's full of mystery. It's, uh, it's elusive. You know, the things I did in the dollhouse were relatively simplistic. They were complicated, but they were happy endings and right prevailed. And they were good people and sort of bad people and not profoundly flawed, difficult. So, yeah, 
But no, that was quite a concept that I was going to have to not just live in the real world, but embrace it as a spiritual path. It was like, oh, mm. no, 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 no. But I did. 30 years later, here I am. And I just want to say something. You know, I didn't know I was autistic. However, as Wilma has pointed out, that's my therapist, uh, the 12 step Al Anon program gave me tools that were brilliant workarounds for autism tools for boundaries, accountability, communication. Because she said, usually people diagnosed as late in life as you are not doing as well as you are. And I really attribute that to 30 years of going to a lot of meetings, having a sponsor. I get a lot of feedback. Something happens I don't understand. I will call up to 20 people to try and figure it out. Um, was it me? Was it them? Do I need to set a boundary? Do I need to apologize? Um, so it sounds as if you've been doing a lot of the work for a long time that a lot of people don't start doing really until they get the diagnosis. Yeah, it was really, you know, it was about tools. It wasn't about what's wrong with you. It's like, all right, I'm in this situation and it isn't working for me. What do I do now? And mm -hmm. my life began to work in big ways when I got into recovery. And were you already writing at that point? Yes. So you, so were you writing all the way along then? No, not until I was in my 30s. Um, that was when I got my memories, came out as an artist, came out as a lesbian. And all of those are, if you pull one of those threads, the other two are coming along with it. That enabled me to understand the story I had to tell. The one I was telling with the doll who had her hair pulled out. Um, it was like, oh, okay. So it was sort of... I went back to the dollhouse thing, which had been dormant for, you know, over a decade and two decades, I guess. And it, it's interesting, like not being able to access the memories of my childhood was keeping me from be recognizing I was lesbian and, you know, um, uh, and also an artist. I just had a lot of integrity, as I think many autistic people do. I couldn't be an artist until I knew what story I had to tell. And I knew uh, as a feminist, I knew I didn't want to tell a men's story, which is what you saw everywhere in films. And I was pretty, I always identified with the victims. It's like, well, who cares about this story? It's a bunch of men, you know, congratulating each other. <laughs> so uh, that was, you know, those three all went together. So it sounds as if then what happened was that you were able to act as what sounds like repressed memories and it gave you the keys to becoming the writer and the person that that you became yes absolutely and then i wrote like my hair was on fire uh it, it really felt like that i just was um and i became disabled from it you know it, we're a secular society and the arts are sacred they're sacred fire and i think if we'd lived in a tribal environment with a shaman somebody would have recognized me as special as called to do sacred work and they would have watched that period of awakening and said okay you're gonna die you have to get some tools and some structure this is sacred work you need to pull some ritual in you're gonna burn yourself out you know and i i wrote a story a play about joan of arc that was very much my story and i felt every night i was just kind of getting up on stage and dousing myself in kerosene and juggling matches. And inevitably it came to the day where I walked out on stage and I just, I couldn't do anything. So I turned around to try to collect myself and start the piece again. And I couldn't make myself turn around. It was the weirdest thing. It was like, I had hundreds of people out front. It was like, turn around and finish the play. Mm -mm. So turn around. And I had a little, I had a little labor management argument going on. I was like, all right, what would it take for you to turn around and finish this play? And I was like, you have to retire this piece for at least a year. I'm not going to perform it anymore. So I was like, okay, all right. And so then I finally turned around and finished the play, but I was getting real close to the end at that point, you know, when an actor can't go on. And I did, I retired it for five years, actually. So looking back now do you interpret that as a shutdown or a burnout completely 
Well, and I also think of it as labor. It was just like, there's no end in sight. If I would perform and it wasn't like, oh good, you get a holiday. It was like, oh great, I have six more tasks for you now. And I just felt like I had not been listening to myself. Why would I? My parents never did. I just told myself, here's what we're doing today. We're going to do six state tour and then we're going to publish this. And then we're going to, you know, I was like, you know, and, uh, I couldn't get my own attention, but let me tell you, when you're standing in front of hundreds of people and you cannot turn around, you physically cannot make your body turn around. That got my attention. It was a sit down strike. It was like, I got, to, I came to the table. What do you want? Tell me what you want. You can, all right, you have leverage now. You, I, you just dictate the terms because we have to finish this play. Yeah. I felt like I was a terrible management person. I was a horrible boss. And the workers finally were like, all right, we're done. We're absolutely done. And this feels to me so much like so, so many people tell me what I've experienced myself in that, you know, what we see on the surface doesn't necessarily affect what's going on underneath. And the fact that we don't always recognize it even in ourselves and that we will push ourselves and push ourselves until we just crack. Oh, and everybody's like, oh my God, you're so prolific. You did it at the beginning of the show. Yeah. yeah. Nobody's saying, so how are the workers at the factory? That's an awful lot of, that's a, that's kind of high production number there. Like you have more going on or you just make them work brutal hours. Like, oh, brutal hours. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I think that uh, when we're all about the straight A student, we should look at it, you know, like that. Like, how's the workers? Mm -hmm. You know, are they getting holidays, vacations, time off? And it's that thing about we as a society valuing productivity above almost anything else. Oh God, yes. And you're doing fine. It, yeah, until I'm not. And, you know, for me, it was a horrifying moment. It probably was all of, I don't know, two minutes. It felt like 20 minutes standing there with my back to the audience. But I think for a lot of women, that's the point where they get institutionalized. And we all know what happens then. You know, that's just when suddenly um, they can't keep it up any longer and they no longer care what happens. Yeah. And when you reach that point you of not being able to carry on, then there is no argument that can make you able to do it because it's not about a choice at that point, is it? I don't think. Well, and the part, part of me was addicted to, oh, you're so productive or like, oh, the show is brilliant. And, you know, oh my God. And, you know, women... They would see me as Joan of Arc and I was young and cute and and they would want to go out with me because they thought they were dating Joan of Arc. Like, no, this is a middle-aged neurotic playwright. You have no idea. And uh, so those experiences were like worse than not being loved. You're being loved for somebody you are absolutely not. So I'd like to date Joan of Arc. Who wouldn't? But that's not me. And that, so that was further, you know, I, the things I did to try to get love is like, you know, pushing your money or your looks. I was all about the talent or whatever. And it's almost like an extension of masking, isn't it? Yes. Well, and the more they go for that, the more part of you is like, oh, they fell for that. Oh, they think I'm Joan of Arc or, oh, they want to be with a writer and, you know, and that's only a small part of who I am and they're not interested in, and, uh, it was very lonely and empty and, and I am single and I'm very isolated and alone now, but it has an integrity to it. It doesn't have that awful feeling of having a partner that's there for the wrong reasons or the perpetual need to mask. It's such a relief. It's like, I get up, I'll be alone all day. It's like, I know what that looks like. I can do that. But that other thing was like, it had a short shelf life. I never knew when the other shoe would drop. I didn't understand my own behaviors. What a relief. I think it's it's some, a really valuable lesson to learn, isn't it? That idea of it's better to be on your own than to be with someone that's not the right person or it's not the right time or whatever. And it's a, it's a hard lesson to learn. And I'm saying that obviously as someone who's in a relationship, but I've been through that early on in my life and being single for a very long time and choosing to be because it was better than putting up with stuff and being with the wrong people. Well, I think passing for normal. For me, my youth was all about what's the game? How do you play it? And watch me win. 
never asked myself, is this a game you want to play? Is this worth playing? Is this going to further in? No, no. It's just like, what is the game? Is it looking good? Is it dating the captain of the football team? Tell me what the game is and I will win it. Oh, so much that. I can remember, you know, as a young adult in my early 20s, being so happy because I'd found a boyfriend and we bought a house. And that to oh, me yeah. was like, I've arrived. I have a Pick house and a boyfriend. Yes. Yeah. The outside, it looks perfect. Awesome partner. Yes. House. Check. Puppy. Check. You know, I, yeah. yeah. And it's very confusing. Uh, you know, I didn't know I was lesbian. And I was, um, I think that I would sort of get with these guys and then, um, and that was an achievement. I would tick a box, you know, and then I would be sort of bored with them and done with them. And I had poured so much energy into getting them. And they just, I think they had no idea what happened to them. And I didn't have any idea either. I was vaguely aware that my behaviors were reprehensible, but I didn't understand them. All I knew was I was really into you. And you know what? Now I'm so not. And so I don't know what else to do except kind of dear John, you, you know, see ya. And so that, um, then I had dissociative disorders, which made, you know, well, now I'm somebody new that really mm -hmm. doesn't know you, never met you, and certainly never had a relationship with you. So this isn't even going to hurt me. You know, I just didn't understand. I know that, that lack of accountability, it, uh, when you don't understand your own story, didn't know I was an incest survivor, didn't know I was a lesbian. And that's, I blame the culture. Why didn't I know I was lesbian? Because I was born in 1952. I never even saw a lesbian film, read a lesbian book. You know, I feel like, yes, I behaved badly, but m there were m layers. And the culture really kept me from knowing who I was and 68 diagnosed as autistic. Today, I think uh, also sort of serious nail biting. I, you know, such that my teachers went, I could always tell when a new person saw my hands, there would be like a, you know, it looked like torture. Um, and, you know, I think now I would have been identified by second or third grade as autistic for sure. Yeah, I think, we're, you know, you're looking at a very, very different time. Well, and young kids now, even if they've come from a right-wing family, they can go on the computer and find the lesbians. Oh, yeah. I mean, things have changed, you know, exponentially, haven't they? I mean, I can remember, the, the, I didn't, I don't think I knew of what a lesbian was until I was about 14. You know, I was sort of growing up as a teenager in the 1990s. You know, I can remember seeing the first gay kiss on British television. Yeah, As a but teenager. Now, you know, now there's <laughs> children's books like little fairy tales, yes. and, you know, yeah, but I, so I kind of like to think I'm the last of that generation who is going to be, you know, decades recognizing all these multiple taboo and heavily stigmatized identities. And have you ever thought about sort of the intersection of different identities? Because I know that, you know, obviously we know that so many autistic people are LGBTQ plus gender non-conforming. Yes, and also, and I was gender dysphoric, and that was, um, you know, for a lot of autistic people, gender's a bad fit. Period. Doesn't matter what you know, blue or pink. Where we, just, a lot of us just don't really feel we're it's in a body. Say, we're almost outside of gender a lot. I think, aren't we? The way you heal from histories like mine is you find an empowering way to incorporate the despised female self, the one that you, as a child, like, oh, hell no, that's not me. And it was the thing I did instinctively with the doll for the neighbor's doll. She wasn't Barbie. She was gender nonconforming. She was fierce. She hung out with women. She rescued women. You know, I found a different way to be female that wasn't all tits and ass and high heels and makeup and all that. And you know, and then I think a, a healthy dollop of autism where male, female, you know, I spent years just hitchhiking around the country, kind of looking like a young boy, you know, it's like, it gender just didn't make sense to me, no matter what it was. Uh, Do you feel it does now? Because I, I feel that, or I find that the older I get, the less and less I identify with gender. Well, I am a rabid feminist. Fem feminism right down to the root uh, saved my life. It made sense of it because I thought I was sick, bad, crazy, and wrong. And it was, it made, everything made sense. 
oh, this is being done to you. Uh-huh. And this is a unrealistic expectation and men would never have to go through this and blah, blah. You know, I just suddenly, everything made sense. And so that has given me my voice and my life work. Mm -hmm. So when you ask, does, I mean, look at me. I mean, you know, it's like, yeah, gender. I don't, I don't, it's like kind of don't put a lot of energy into it, you know, and I don't wear uh, women's clothes. I'm wearing a dress and I don't know, uh, you know, you know, but that is not to be confused with, um, are you a woman? Are you female? But yeah, I was going to say that's more about gender expression. And that depends on, on stereotype, doesn't it? And, and what we consider. Queer culture to be. blurs that a lot. Yes. Yeah, yes. yeah, exactly. And it's also important to put it through the lens of autism, like, you know, because you're autistic. Gender may not be a good fit no matter what it is. All of that. And that really informs my work hugely. I have a I have I have a whole index of plays for gender nonconforming slash lesbian butch lead characters. I'd like to move on a little bit now. I'd like to talk to you about something um, sort of health related, because I, I believe that, um, and it's interesting because I've had a lot of conversations in the past few days on Instagram about this, um, as it happens, and this is um, chronic fatigue. Oh, God. Uh, well, you know, it is identical. All right, I'm not a scientist. Maybe it's not identical, but from what I read, it's the same symptoms as long haul COVID. And in my, gen I was stricken in 87. I had a very severe case of flu and I was never uh, well again. And um, at that time, uh, it was mostly women getting sick. Nobody, um, the doctors would draw blood, look at urine and say, there's nothing wrong with you. I'm like every organ in my body, you know, uh, you no, know, there's something seriously wrong mm -hmm. with me. And, um, I couldn't get on disability because it wasn't a real, it was a psychosomatic, it's all in your head. Um, so that's terrifying. I couldn't work, I'm way too sick to work. Just really frustrating. And the CDC was a problem, you know, in our country. That's a center for contagious diseases. They took the position up until three years ago, up till three years ago on their website, they had a um, discredited study that we really just kind of needed to get out of bed and exercise. Which oh, if you know anything about chronic fatigue, if I walked around the block, I'd go to bed for two weeks. It's no joke. It's a, uh, yeah. I felt like somebody on the top of Everest where, you know, you, you, you look at your boot and whether you should tie your boot or not. And it's like too hard because mm -hmm. your oxygen, it really felt like I am not utilizing oxygen. I am, I am moving and thinking you just eat the raw oatmeal because to light the stove, to, you know, it's just like, there's a cost benefit analysis when you're at extreme high altitudes that was identical to like, I'm cold. I should close the window. The window's 10 feet away. I think I'll just be cold. I'd be at a party at somebody's house. I didn't know. And I would have to ask the host if I could go in the bedroom and collapse because I couldn't sit up in a chair anymore. Uh, sometimes I just lie down on the floor where I was. It, it was awful. But, you know, multiple chemical sensitivities. I couldn't pump gas because I would be too weak to stand from the fumes. I would have to sit down on the sidewalk or lie down on the sidewalk and hopefully somebody would finish the gas for me. If I drove anywhere, I had to drive at three in the morning because uh, that's when there were fewer cars on the road and the exhaust was somewhat manageable. If I hiked somewhere, I would just tell my friend, I'm just going to have to, I might have to just suddenly step to the side and lie down and sleep for 15 minutes. And all the time, the doctors are like, nothing wrong with you. It's like. It oh, was, and that's the most frustrating thing, isn't it? And then, and it is, has a, you know, I had, um, I had um, encephalitis, the, you know, the inflammation of the brain case. I could feel it. I would tell people. You know, it's like a brain on fire, or I felt like I was being electrocuted. I could feel electrical disturbances. Um, and uh, and that made me so irritable that I couldn't have a 10 minute conversation with someone without being overwhelmed. So at a time when I desperately needed social networks, I drove everybody away. I was so irritable and 
irrational and paranoid that had panic attacks because I didn't understand your brain case is inflamed and none of this is correlating to anything happening externally. So, you know, you just didn't have any help with it. It was terrifying. It seems to me that we just anecdotally, it just feels as if we seem to be kind of more likely to end up with these things, with autoimmune things, with fatigue related conditions. It just feels like a thing to well, me. Well, you know, okay. I mean, so I got flu or I got Lyme. I mean, it was real. I was sicker than a damn dog, the fevers and the nose and the cough and all that. However, I had just estranged from my immediate and extended family. I had been thrown out of my church for being a lesbian. I had been fired from the public schools twice for being uh, unwilling to closet myself. I had been evicted. Um, you know, I had a theater company that was lesbian and I was threatened for that, had to close the theater, move out of state. So you look at that, it's like, you know, or how was that immune system anyway? you know, with somebody in the bosom of their family, with this, all kinds of support networks. Yeah, especially what we, with what we know about you know, the connection between, you know, the brain and the body and how stress can affect us. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, I think in my, gen, you know, people that aren't diagnosed early, probably things are breaking down by the late 20s or 30s. I imagine there's a lot of people with autism, particularly if they're not diagnosed, that there's a period in their life where it starts to fall apart and the things, the stress starts to really come in. And mm -hmm. and I don't want to in any way suggest that these are psychosomatic because they're not. But I think that, you know, when you have an immune system that's already at the breaking point and there's a deer tick or there's a virus from somebody with flu at work, Flu was going around. I worked in a library. Nobody got sick like me, though. I was fucking sick. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I think that was possibly, I didn't know how to take care of myself. I just soldiered on. And again, the workers were like, you know what? We, we're not getting out of bed. We're, we're done. So looking back now, now that you've had this diagnosis at this stage in life, do you think that anything might have been different had you been diagnosed or understood that you were autistic much earlier on in life, in terms of your work, in terms of your life? Yes. Um, well, and couple that with incest and lesbianism. If I had been able to claim all these stigmatized identities earlier, I would have been much more strategic. I was a litigious person and that was that social justice piece. And I would have said to myself, oh, I know you feel like you should go to court and sue. That's understandable, good for you. And that's an autism thing. Let's think about this. We, we might not have to sue everybody because it's very expensive and it's killing us. Uh, but I didn't know it just, I would just be overwhelming. I can't live with this, this is just wrong. And I think that knowing I was autistic, I would have been like, all right, this, 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 this overwhelming compulsion is probably autism. And it would have given me a little wiggle where I'm like, maybe I don't have to file a lawsuit now. Maybe I can step away from that. Um, and I think, you know, I would have not tried to be heterosexual. I would have been able to recruit allies a great deal. And I might have known that I have a special interest, the dollhouse slash playwriting. And I need to strategize how to not drive myself crazy with that. Vacations, breaks. Yeah, because we get the hyper focus going on, don't we? And oh, yeah. we just go down There's, rabbit holes and hours and or days pass. And suddenly there you are with your back to the audience and you will not turn around. It was like, yeah. oh, how did I get here? It's like not listening clearly. There's a lot of you that don't want to do this anymore. Yeah, I, th I think that, I, I think everything, everything would have been different. And if I had had partners, I would have, you know, made it clear that, I look insensitive and self-absorbed, and that's an unkind spin on my neurodiversity. And we can work around some of this, and some of it we can't. But you know, they would they would be informed what they're getting into, and I wouldn't end up feeling, oh my God, I'm so self-absorbed and insensitive. I'm just unfit for human companionship. I wouldn't have been so hard on myself. I'd be like, no, it's fucking autism. <laughs> 
I'd also like to ask you, I, I was re really fascinated when I was sort of researching you a little bit before this interview to find out where, where, where you live now. Mm. And it just made me think about autistic people and how we like to live and what the best sort of places for us to live are. And I was just really fascinated to learn about a place I've never actually heard of before, which is Mount Desert Island, which is where you live in Maine. Yeah. So how did you come to move there and what makes it a good place for you? Well, I was living in Maine. I lived in Portland for 20 years. I was mm -hmm. still working and I needed to get to airports. I made most of my money touring to universities and colleges. And I just um, would go up to Mount Desert Island, which has one of the most beautiful national parks in the States, the Acadia National Park. And I loved it there. It was a spiritual place. It was just that place. And I realized I could afford to leave Portland. That I realized I believe I'm going to not run out of money before I die. You know, I'm 70, almost 70. And it's like, I can do this. I can buy a small cottage. I can also Airbnb for top dollar because it's a national park. It's Bar Harbor. It's, you know, it's the Rockefellers. It's Martha Stewart. You know, it's um, used to be Julia Child, but you know, it's a, it's a very highly desired tourist area. Mm -hmm. and, and then of course, half the year, it's a fishing village. So I moved up on the island. I moved to Southwest Harbor and that was the best thing I ever did. I can without having to drink because of the chronic fatigue, I can get to like a hundred trailheads in 10 minutes and I can climb 29 peaks that are, you know, under a thousand feet um, and be home by noon and go to bed, you know, yeah, but yeah. for somebody who loves nature and the outdoors, but who's also severely stricken is a brilliant solution. And um, nature is very healing for me. Uh, so that it was, it's been really good for my writing too. I don't tour anymore. I miss that a little bit, but in the pandemic hit and it's like, well, I've kind of, I'm set up here. I kind of got this life already. That's kind of pandemic -y, So, and do you enjoy it? Do you love your life now? I do. Yeah. And I have, I converted my garage. And so I use it to attract my friends. You know, I'm autistic. I can't be a traditional host because people drive me crazy. But I say, I give you a key, you have your own entrance, you have your own bathroom, you've got two rooms. Come on up and have a national park vacation. Maybe we'll have a meal. Maybe we'll take a walk. Maybe we won't. But I feel them. They're here. They love me, but they're here for the park. So I use it like a bait thing. And it has helped with my isolation. Or I meet oh. artists, theater artists. I'm like, I've got a retreat space. Come up and use it. And... Uh, it's manageable. They're not in my home. They don't get up every morning like, what are we going to do? What do you want for breakfast? It's like, no. And I don't <laughs> let them in my kitchen. They don't come into my part of the house. And I know that seems weird. And sometimes they don't know how to deal with it because they're not a house guest, but they're not paying either. So it's like, what's, what is this? It really works for me. It really, really works for me. I, they don't bother me, but I don't feel quite as isolated. So. I love this so much. Well, it's... listen, come and have a vacation. <laughs> I'd love to, but yeah. um, but seriously, th this thought has crossed my mind because I, I would. My dream is to is to have somewhere in the. We live in the city at the moment. Is to have somewhere in the country, and I think I would probably perhaps be a bit more social in my own way, for what, what reasons you just said. Because then you'd have enough space and you could have people just to come and spend time, yes. but not spend time, spend time, but not in the same space all the time. Well, and also if the world collapses, you know, given that it's a three room suite. I can get $200 a night for five months because, I mean, mm -hmm. that's work, you know, that's, oh, I found a hair in the bathroom. That, that is like, <laughs> you know, that is, it's a professional innkeeper. However, you know, that it's nice to have that option. Uh, I'm not exercising it. It's a free space now, but I'm aware. Or if I break my leg and since I don't have a partner and I don't have any family, I can offer cheap or free rent in the annex <clears throat> if you'll cook a meal for me or do some errands. It, it just is a little piece of security in a very mm. autistic way. Yes. Um, I can bring people into my world <clears throat> and they're not in my space. And that's yeah. important to me. Sure. No, that makes so much sense. And it's exactly how I feel as well. Because I, I love, I'd love to be a person that entertains all the time, but it's just not realistic because I know that I can't cook with people in the mornings, for example. 
as you just well, said. Well, and this thing yeah. where, you know, and partly chronic fatigue, but maybe some autism, like, you know, I can make a plan. And it's like, you know, that sounded good yesterday and yes. I don't want to do it today. And uh, so they're not in my space. And I'm just real clear, any plans we make are tentative. But because they're using it like an Airbnb, it isn't going to wreck their day. Like, I'm not going to spend it with you. It's like, no, they come up here with their own agenda um, and use yes. it like an Airbnb. So I oh. don't feel that pressure like, oh, they're counting on having dinner with you. I'm like, you know what? I'm not going to join you for dinner tonight. That's just not going to work for me. And they're like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know. That's, it's like a help to me. That seems like an evolved level of socializing. Well, the f interesting thing is how difficult it is for people to wrap their head around it. Like, they don't know how to, neurotypical people don't understand that. Like, do I, you know, I'm not your guest. I feel like some people haven't come back because they honestly couldn't figure it out. And they just read it as, I don't like them. Or, you know, they, they it's a hard model for them. Now, I haven't had an autistic friend come, but I think they would get it immediately. Like, oh, great, perfect. Oh, I mean, I have. It just makes, it makes perfect sense to me. I <laughs> Maybe I come up and I don't want to see you either. It's like, <laughs> I get that and I won't be hurt, you know, like come up and use it however you want, you yeah. know. Because if I go and stay with somebody, not like that happens very often these days, but if I did, I find, you know, one night maybe and after that. It's, pro it's a problem because I needed my own space. I need to be off on my own to recharge and recalibrate. So it's, it goes both ways. And I just find, I honestly, most people are just boring to me. The, the things that interest them and that they talk about. Some of that may be survivor stuff. I feel a little bit like, I feel my generation went to Vietnam, which was a ghastly war. And I feel for them, like when they came back, how on earth did they talk to anybody who hadn't been there? I get it. You know, it's like, and once you've seen the underbelly, so I feel very, um, I can't have those conversations with people who haven't lived my life. And it's interesting, as you've been speaking, as I've been thinking as well about how just generally, I think I find that talking to other autistic people is, feels different, just generally, that like you said just now sometimes I don't find people and haven't and haven't all my life particularly interesting and the things that they talk about and I think maybe that is a bit of an autistic thing but it doesn't happen with other autistic people that's interesting well and also I was a uh, very low income as you can imagine lesbian playwright and I remember my 30s and 40s all my neurotypical people were going up the ladder and they were buying a better car and they really wanted to talk about their real estate and their things and i'm renting in crack houses you know and i'm like i am intentionally like again it's not reality's too grim i'm i'm talking about the next play i'm working on that was huge for me i get it now i'm a homeowner i i can you know get down with like the backyard deck i can do that but there were like decades where I just was, they want to talk about restaurants and real estate. And I'm like, Jesus Christ, what a wasteland. I just, yes. Um, and I realized now some of that's autism. I just thought maybe it's, I'm an artist and they're not, or I'm poor. I don't own mm -hmm. shit. So I don't want to talk about owning shit. I don't know, but whatever it is, I had a friend in college and she said, you know, Carol, you need to be careful because if you eat by yourself long enough, pretty much you're going to find out that even when you sit down with a bunch of people, you're still eating by yourself. I never forgot that. And here I am at 68 and it's like, yep, I can be surrounded by people. And it's like, oh, I'm eating by myself here. So, um, so it's kinder for me to not try to have a partner, not try to host all these people. Cause it's that just, mm -hmm. if I'm eating alone, let's make it look like that. I have my little table. I'm the only one in the room. I'm eating alone, but when I'm eating alone at a table full of people, it confuses me. I feel like there's something wrong with me or I project yes. it on them. They're excluding me. Yes. I, you know, it's just like, just let me have my table and just accept this is the walk we're doing this life. I eat alone. I've so often said that, you know, I've, I don't think I've ever felt lonely or bored on my own. Mm -hmm. But I felt lonely and bored so many times when I've been in company. Oh, and with these partners, with the women, I feel for the women who tried to love me. 
but I never felt so unloved as when I was trying to be physically intimate and they're a million miles away from my psyche, my spirituality, from the faintest concept mm -hmm. of who I am. But not connecting with you on a level where it's you and your actual self. I'm not here and you don't even notice. Like that's mm. unfair to them, unfair to It's the eating alone thing. It's like, you know, I just easier to just accept that I'm alone, but it's hard. It's hard for sure. Yeah. Well, I could literally talk to you all day and it, it's, <laughs> and it's getting that, it, and it's getting me. that way because nobody knows what the time is. <laughs> so I've got one final question I ask everybody. So I'm going to ask you too, which is, if you could go back in time to before at any point before your diagnosis, which gives you some scope, um, <laughs> what age would you go back to? And what, if anything, would you want to tell your pre-aware, <clears throat> pre-diagnosed autistic self? Uh, probably two, as soon as I could establish contact, you know, and I would, I would tell her, you know, it's going to be real hard for a long time, but it has a purpose. I am... I'm actually, a, I'm, I'm a pretty good playwright. My plays change people's lives and they save lives. Um, and it has redeemed my childhood. I would tell her that. Um, and I would tell her, you know, you're autistic. The ways that you're different are wonderful. But you're going to understand so many things in ways that are going to label you to save so many lives. And, and you're a lesbian. And that is just the... That is going to be a source of constant joy and inspiration to you forever. But yeah, a little heartbreaking. Mm. It's going to be a hard life. But it would be easier if I had known those things. Sure. And I think that's so true, isn't it? That, you know, just having that knowledge inside ourselves, even if it wasn't, let's say, having the diagnosis and ex anything external, but just knowing something about the reason that we are the way that we are. Yeah. Mm. Well, thank you ever so much for coming on and talking to me and sharing so openly today. This is the best really interview I've ever lovely. done. It's oh. really substantive. I, you know, yes, people thank yeah, you. interview me about my work a lot. And this is like the best. This I'm sending everybody to this URL. You have to send it to me as soon as you put it up. This is like I really, I am talking about stuff that is engaging me all the parts this this interview integrated me nothing integrates me i'm usually some piece of me is talking and this was wonderful this was a gift thank you oh thank you so much for saying that that's and i'm so glad that, that, is, that that's true that's brilliant um thank you i'm really really pleased i've really enjoyed talking to you as well genuinely really really interesting and very finally then before we go do you have any links that you'd like to share where can people find you oh my name is carolyn c-a-r-o-l-y-n gage G-A-G-E. And my site is carolengage.com. And you can get to my email. My entire catalog of 96 plays and 10 books and so on is online. You can order in many different formats. I always love to hear from people. Yeah, so carolengage.com. Perfect. And I'll pop that in the show notes as well so people can definitely easily find that and click on it. Brilliant. Okay, well, thank you ever so much. Thank you. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode of the Square Peg podcast, I'd be delighted if you'd subscribe and leave a review on Apple Podcasts. It helps other people find the show. And if you want to find out more about Square Peg, you can find me on Instagram at squarepeg.community and on my website, www.squarepeg.community. If you're enjoying the show, you can also join the community over on Patreon. In return for your support, you'll get rewards and bonuses. You can find the link in the show notes and on my website.